developer, which would have ended Park and almost certainly resulted in the demolition of the historic school building that contributes so much to the character of Plymouth. Now, fair warning. The next handful of slides will review the financial status and outlook for Park. I realize that a bunch of number slides isn't everybody's cup of tea, but we'll do our best to make it understandable because it's important to appreciate the serious financial challenges that we're facing and what had to be done to successfully address those challenges in the plan we ultimately developed and agreed with the Community Foundation. This slide shows the trend of annual revenue generated at Park, excluding donations, from the first full year of operations in 2016 through to what's presently projected in 2019 and 2020. Revenue in 2018, the third bar, was an estimated $600,000. That was 30% higher than Park's first year, demonstrating the tremendous increase in demand in our community for what's happening at Park. As mentioned below the chart, about three quarters of the revenue growth through 2020 is explained by the growth in tenant organizations who pay rent to operate at Park. These two pie charts further illustrate that rent received from tenant organizations is the financial engine of Park's operations. The chart on the left shows various sources of Park's revenue in 2016. On the right of that chart, you can see the tenant rent provided 34% or about one third of Park's total revenue. Moving around that pie chart, you'll see that the pool provided almost the same amount, followed by the gym, theater, and football stadium. The chart on the right shows our present projections for 2020 with the growth in tenant rent approaching close to half of total projected revenue. Now there's no way to confidently predict when the demand by organizations that want to operate at Park will top out, but it is a big building. And as noted in the second bullet point on this slide, if, if tenant growth were to continue and fill every available classroom, that could provide about $150,000 of additional annual revenue. That's obviously what we'll try to accomplish, but it's not something that can be counted on in setting a realistic financial plan. Revenue explains what comes into Park, excluding donations. Now we'll turn to what goes out in order to support the daily operations. This slide shows the trend of annual expenses. The middle bar shows that estimated expenses in 2018 were $747,000. Note that expenses in 2018 were about the same as in 2017. That backs up the prediction we made that Park's business model should, in normal conditions, do a good job of limiting increases in expenses, thereby allowing increases in revenue to largely flow through and improve the bottom line. So then why, you may wonder, is there a big projected increase in expenses in 2019? As explained in the comments under the chart, the biggest reason is significantly higher utility and insurance costs now that the Park nonprofit organization is the owner which means we lose the benefit of lower rates that were charged when the owner was Plymouth Canton Community Schools. We likely would have continued to receive lower rates, by the way, if the village had, uh, millage had passed and the owner became the city and township in the form of a recreational authority. This pie chart shows the big categories that make up parks expenses. Payroll accounts for about half of total expense. At a typical community center, that percentage would be much higher. We'll look at park staffing on the next slide. At the higher rates we just discussed, we expect utilities and insurance to be the next biggest expenses, together costing about a quarter million dollars per year, or about 30% of total expense. Park's present paid staffing by position is shown on the right side of this slide. Our business model as a landlord allows us to operate with only four four salaried employees, an executive director, a building slash marketing manager, a building engineer, and the aquatics director. Also listed are the present hourly and part-time positions, the biggest number of which are swim staff. Swim is the only program that park manages, the rest are managed by the tenant organizations. Now this slide brings together the revenues and expenses and it shows that Park had its smallest net loss to date in 2018, 
at $147,000. If the millage had passed so we avoided the increase in utility and insurance costs, we would be looking at a loss in 2020 closer to 50 to 100,000. In our view and the view of the independent business consultants, that would have been offset by an anticipated profit for the Performing Arts Center. That's not going to happen, however. So we're instead facing annual losses in excess of 200,000. Just as you do with budgeting for your household, we'll strive to do better, for example, attracting more tenants. But also, like household financial planning, it's prudent to be realistic or a little cautious. That's even more true for an organization like Park because we can't borrow money to cover shortfalls like you can. The millage not only would have stopped the annual operating loss, it also provided the capital needed to modernize and improve the existing building and address, address infrastructure needs such as the deteriorated parking lot. As you may recall, the cost of the full improvement plan was seven to eight million dollars for the building and an additional several million for infrastructure, an undetermined portion of which will still be needed even without the Performing Arts Center. What we've done, as Don mentioned, is scale back the capital improvement plan. I'm not sure how legible this slide is from the audience, so let me explain. The top section shows expected mandatory spending requirements during the next two years. That totals an estimated $400,000 for emergency repairs that based on experience to date will run about $100,000 per year, plus some needed roof work. The bottom section lists what were referred to as discretionary improvements. These items can be deferred for a bit until capital becomes available, but these are improvements that do need to happen. The sooner the better. For example, air conditioning and ventilation in the pool, gym, theater, Windows to replace the hideous fill-ins and restore the brighter, more attractive, more historic look. The parking lot, upgraded small theater, restrooms, brick repairs, etc. The directional cost estimate for the scaled back capital improvement plan is about $5 million. With the exception of a generous grant that will be discussed shortly, Park without the millage does not presently have any funds to execute even the scaled back plan. Let me first say thanks for enduring that review of the financials. That perspective, however, should help clarify what's needed for Park to survive and thrive. First, we'll have to cover the annual operating loss with donations. As previously shown, that requirement is presently estimated at about $250,000 per year. Second, Park needs additional money to establish a rainy day fund, just as all of us try to maintain a savings reserve to handle family emergencies. In Park's case, we also need to be prepared in case the operating loss gets bigger during inevitable economic recessions. And third, we also need to come up with the estimated $5 million required to maintain and improve the existing building, parking lot, et cetera. All these elements together demonstrate the challenge we faced in coming up with a plan to make Park financially viable in the absence of the millage. And we had to convince the Community Foundation that such a plan has high confidence of success, or else they would have had no real choice other than to sell the building and all the property and put the sale proceeds into a charitable fund. As you know, we did come up with a high confidence plan and a grant from Community Foundation facilitated Park becoming the owner on January 2nd. The next few slides summarize some key elements of the agreement with Community Foundation. The agreement stipulates that the property must be used for charitable purpose. That fits with Park's mission to enrich lives through quality arts, education, and recreation programs for all ages. Park must remain a 501c3 charitable organization which basically means we're approved by the IRS is a charity for tax deduction purposes, and no individuals ever have or ever can benefit financially. As shown on the second point on this slide, the agreement requires, requires that the school building be historically preserved and remain historically significant forever. 
as it was with the post office, the main reason Patty and I first got involved was to try to save this irreplaceable piece of Plymouth history. So we are absolutely delighted that the largest historic building remaining in Plymouth will still be standing and serving the community long after we're gone. Community Foundation will not be involved in the operation of PARC. Through financial and operating ports, they will monitor to ensure we remain financially solvent and stay true to our mission. If PARC fails at any point in the future, Community Foundation has the right to take back the building and property. Regarding the critical challenge of financial viability, we and the Community Foundation believe there should be enough donations from the public and foundations to cover the annual operating losses. Don will discuss donations in a bit. But that leaves PARC without funds for a rainy day fund or capital improvements, which led to the following difficult but essential part of the agreement. To be financially viable without the millage, PARC must either get a large donation to build the Performing Arts Center, which is theoretically possible, but highly unlikely, or we will have to sell the excess land is our only remaining way to get the funds needed to keep PARC alive. This site map may help clarify what we're referring to as the excess land, which is the shaded area outlined in red. To help with orientation, Adam Street is at the bottom of this map. Working up the shaded area of the slide, the land to be sold would roughly comprise the tennis courts, the practice field where the Performing Arts Center was planned, the football field and track, and the land between the Cultural Center and Miracle League that connects to Theodore Street. This is, of course, subject to refinement and normal city in the normal city review process. What would be retained for park would essentially be the existing building and existing parking lot. Now it pains us to lose this space and among other things deprive Steelers football of their longtime home. But let's remember that this is the only practical way, the last resort, if you will, to save the existing building and park. Otherwise, we would be dealing with the even greater pain of losing everything. And who knows, maybe some other good Samaritans, either individuals or a foundation, will step forward to buy the property and retain it as is or work with the city on a worthwhile community recreational or other purpose. That's obviously beyond our control, but we would love to see it happen. Now I'll turn it back to Don. Obviously, some uh, very difficult times of that. And we had to make some very difficult choices. But, you know, sometimes a half a loaf is better than a whole loaf. And the half a loaf is very, very valuable. And I'm going to just recap a little bit some of the tenants that are in there and the things that go on. And I think we need to keep in mind who it is that we're really trying to serve here in the community and what is really relevant. Uh, in the long term. We got three components. One is on the arts arena. Uh, just recently added Acorn Glass. So some of you have been to Greenfield Village and you see the glass blower. He's been there I think 10 years. Philip just does magnificent work. He now is operating in park. He's moved an entire operation in there. Artistry Dance came in about a year ago. They got two studios in there. Do a magnificent job. Arts Detroit just came in a couple of months ago. Arts Detroit is a very elite organization that coaches and trains the really elite talent, performing arts talent in our high schools in our immediate area. And the idea is to prepare them for a career in performing arts and to help them assist them in getting into the best universities to do that. Uh, uh, the Central Park Arts Studio, a pottery a studio, uh, Leslie just does a great job. You need to go in and have a look at what she does. Eden Arts Cooperative, uh, giving music instructions, piano, vocals, 
uh, the guitar, drums, you name it. They got several studios in there really serving the kids in our community. Forever After Productions, many of you are familiar with them. They've been around a couple of decades doing uh, theater, particularly with, uh, with uh, students and high school students. In fact, Mamma Mia is going to be on six shows next week, I believe. Uh, check it out. They do a great job in that. In the band music studio, Nick Brandon runs that. If you got kids in your house that are driving you crazy with uh, rehearsing their instruments and doing their drums, send them to Nick. That's all he does there. And he's got a foundation funding that effort. And they go in there and play their heart's content. They form bands. They go out and really have done some magnificent work. Uh, Chris Craft Photography, doing instruction in photography, Main Street Opera Theater, uh, Noel, uh, Noel does uh, uh, instruction in opera as well as a lot of opera performances. Carson Michigan Philharmonic, been in there, uh, they've been 74 years I believe in a Plymouth community. Plymouth Artist Collect uh, Collective, it's an area in park where individual artists, visual artists, can come in, rent their little space, and do their work and get a number of them in the same general area. Redline Youth Percussion. Make it a point to come in and see these 40 some odd kids, high school kids, from all over the region, coming in there and they do drum performances that'll knock your socks off, believe me. Uh, it is a load of fun and they are very, very talented. Tony Rocco. Now internationally known uh, is uh, an artist, visual artist, operates in there, also doing instructions for kids. And of course, Michigan Philharmonic Youth Orchestra with 130, 140 kids in it um, are there all the time doing rehearsals every Tuesday night. Uh, just a terrific organization. On the education arena, we now have bees. Yeah, you've probably heard bees in the D, you know, beehives in downtown Detroit putting them on tops of buildings. Well, now we'll have bees in the pea, I guess. <laughs> we'll have beehives, a couple of them on a roof uh, when springtime comes, so uh, we'll have beehives. Uh, College for Creative Studies, many of you are familiar with them. Uh, they just re up for uh, another couple of years in their lease, doing a fantastic job. The uh, only satellite operation for College for Creative Studies in their 115-year history outside Detroit. And they picked Plymouth and they picked Park, and let me tell you, they are an asset to this community uh, beyond what most people can imagine. Friends of the Rouge moved in this past fall. Uh, some of you may be familiar with them. They do a lot of work on the Rouge River. What I didn't know, their primary work is in education, and uh, education environmental issues, and they're in, involved in a lot of things, doing terrific work in our schools. Uh, momentum therapy uh, for Kids on the spectrum, uh, doing a lot of fine work with that. And then uh, Plymouth Christian Academy has their entire robotics program operating out of there. They operate year-round. Uh, Proud Mitt and Shared Kitchen. Marlo's uh, here tonight. She was sitting down here. Marlo opened an incubator kitchen. I think maybe the only private one in the state of Michigan. Michigan State was in there studying how she's doing this to try to get more made in Michigan uh, work in in our state. If you got you think you got the best guacamole in the world and you want to get it into the store, come and see Marlo. She'll help you with all the legal stuff, health department, labeling, all of that. And she's had some very successful experiences uh, with some of the folks that have been in there. Uh, the Simple Kitchen, Kristen uh, does culinary arts classes. She's booked up, I think, for two months now. Just took off and doing a, a great job from kids seven years old to seniors and a whole variety of culinary arts. And now just recently, the YMCA has teamed up with the park to offer preschool enrichment program for kids uh, three to five years of age. This is new too. And in spite of the fact of the millage and the uncertainty and everything else, we've had a lot of these organizations coming on board just trusting that somehow we'll find a way through this maze and they'll have a home there. Recreation, we've got basketball leagues, the cruisers are there, a swim team. We have swimming classes for virtually from toddlers to seniors. And it's more cost effective than anywhere else you could go uh, for f swimming instructors. Steelers are there, our Lady of Good Council, both uh, doing football programs, Z-Spot Fitness, a whole list of uh, fitness programs that are carried out there. Pickleball, I saw a few of you here that are pickleball fans. And 
Uh, if you don't know, I won't get into it now. Social walking and a, a number of senior programs. But in order to keep this all going, and you can see how could we after two and a half, three years of being in this, being able to attract all of these organizations to park and the terrific service that they do for this community. We just have to find a way to keep this going. I mean, it's unconscionable, I think, that, that we would not be able to put together a plan that would keep them engaged in, in participating in our community. So that gets us to fundraising. And, you know, we got the land, and, uh, which is a great thing. And, uh, and uh, Alan, maybe turn the lights on, thanks. But we need money. We need a bunch of about $7, $8 million to do the renovations. And we, as Mark said, need about $200,000, $250,000 a year, uh, well off into the future until we can figure out how we might be able to minimize that. But we've got to raise a lot of money. And fortunately, very early on, well, even prior to the millage, we had some grants that were all subject to the millage. You know, none of these foundations want to put money into a project that they don't have confidence in is going to be funding. They don't want to write you a million dollar check and six months later the place is shut down. So there was some reluctance prior to the millage and we got some grants subject to the millage. One of those was the Wilcox Foundation. And I think the biggest or one of the biggest grants the Wilcox Foundation has ever done was a million dollar multi-year pledge to park. And I, I'd like to have uh, Dan Harriman come on up here. Dan's with the Wilcox Foundation on the board and I think he ought to, we needed this uh, an initiative early on in order to uh, get the attention of other foundations and the like. If the Wilcox Foundation says it's a go, there's a lot of other people out there to say, okay, they've done the due diligence. If they're in, maybe we can get in. So it's more, it's not just the amount of money, a million dollars is a big, a big number, but it is also the credibility it's brought to the project. Dan? Thank you, Don, and good evening to all. On, on behalf of Foundation trustees Scott Dodge, Wynn Schrader, and myself, the Wilcox Family Foundation is proud to award a grant to Park, a $1 million pledge to fund operations and a 150 to 200 seat theater. The theater is to be named the Jack Wilcox Theater. With our confidence in Don Soonan, the Malcolms, and so many others whom have given generously in so many ways, the Wilcox Family Foundation is pleased to present the first installment of this $1 million pledge. Some of you present this evening knew Jack. You knew him to be smart, energetic, and compassionate. You also knew him to be somewhat frugal. Jack's frugality resulted in the accumulation of some assets. With the resources that Jack accumulated, coupled with his love for the Plymouth community, Jack left his entire estate to benefit his hometown. A little story about Jack's ability to conserve. Some of you may have heard this. Jack owned a desktop computer. In the 1990s, he decided to get internet access. AT&T worked with Jack to provide him with dial-up service. The dial-up didn't work. After considerable troubleshooting, the problem was diagnosed. Dial-up internet access did not work if the customer had a party line. <laughs> Some younger folks may need an explanation about what that is. Jack's directive to us was that his assets should be used to build a better future. And of course, essential to building a better future is providing varied opportunities for our residents in the arts, education, and recreation. Park is doing just that. To date, the Wilcox Family Foundation has provided the Plymouth community with several million dollars in scholarship awards for college-bound students and grants to nonprofits that serve, serve the Plymouth community. Every person in this room has a connection, of course, to the Plymouth community. You are what make the community a great place. Your support for Park will make Plymouth an even greater community now and for generations to come. Thank you. Just for all of you to know, the 
foundation uh, gave the first uh, two hundred dollars. I guess they want us over here in the light. Can't see through the podium. First two hundred thousand dollar check was this year, and there's another hundred thousand dollars coming every year for the next eight years. I mean, this is very, very much appreciative, and I appreciate it. And as I told you earlier, it's not only the money; it's the credibility it brings to the project. It answers a lot of questions for a lot of other people about whether Park's the real deal and whether we can trust that this is going to go forward. They did a year of their due diligence on us <clears throat> before this uh, came about. So, Dan, we really, really appreciate it. And Dan was instrumental in that. Uh, Wayne Schrader, Dan, and Scott Dodd. And all three of them took a great deal of interest in this project. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jack Wilcox. Yeah. <laughs> Now we have some other foundations that um, that uh, we're going to be working with. Some of them had committed to uh, uh, grants subject to the millage. We need to work with them. Well, they, are they still in? So we got some work to do there. But let me tell you, um, we're not going to be able to do it on foundation grants alone. You know, Plymouth is not exactly an impoverished community, and a lot of the money is going to Detroit and elsewhere. And it's tough to get them. But we have naming rights available to a lot of foundations for the pool, the gym, uh, individual rooms, and there's a couple of folks in this room that put their name on the rooms. Uh, and uh, seats, we'll be selling seats in that theater. It'll have about 180 to 200 seats. It's a cafeteria now that we've uh, kind of modified into a, a makeshift theater, uh, but we need to really make improvements on that. But then it's really going to come down to individuals families and, and people in the community, I think, in order to step up and really support this. So to jumpstart the campaign, we're trying to consider how do we really engage the community and, and get off to a good start. We decided to do a, a double your $100 and do a, a matching a gift campaign. Whoops, did I get it? I guess you advanced it. Yeah, okay. Um, so Colleen and I, She's finally up and about today. So she's probably going to be a little bit surprised about this. Didn't get a chance to talk to her. <laughs> but she's usually a pretty good sport. <laughs> Colleen and I will match the first $100 anybody gives to this campaign, to the matching campaign, between uh, now and the end of February. So we got six weeks. So during that time, up to $100,000 we will match. So if you give $100, we'll match $100. If you give $1,000, we'll match $100. We want to spread this out and build a broad base. And as you came in, there, you got some cards that explain the program a little bit. Uh, and we would also, it, it's no uh, surprise how we came up with the $100. You probably figured that out. The $100 is what the millage would have cost the average homeowner in the city and the township. And so we're, what we're asking people to consider is, if you voted for 9,000 voters voted for the park package, if you believe in it and you were willing to commit $100 a year for the next 20 years, would you also be willing to commit $100 per year to the park project? And on that card, you can commit multiple years and the like and how much you want. We are going to need your support, and there is no other way around it. I won't get into details on the card. I think it's self-explanatory, uh, but uh, you know, you can fill it out. I'd prefer you fill it out and drop it off tonight. It only takes a minute. Uh, you do have envelopes with it. You can mail them in, call the office, or go online, PlymouthPark.com, and there's a donate button on there. You can do it there, too. But with 9,000 voters voting yes, that's probably 4,500 households or so that voted for it. And if each household were to commit uh, the hundred dollars, that's four hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, and that would go a long way toward solving our problems when we get the community to do that. So I'd ask you to seriously consider that, and uh, it would be a huge help, obviously. But you know we're going to need more. We're going to need more help in bringing in more tenants. And if you know anybody that uh, might be looking for a space that's in arts recreation or education, we're limiting it to that, 
That's our mission. We're not going to have banks in there, real estate offices, or any of that. It's going to be organization in the arts, recreation, education arena. Then volunteer. We need volunteers for virtually everything. I mean, we need some office volunteers. We do parking. We need 7580 to cover uh, art in the park. When we're doing parking on our lot, we make eight nine thousand uh, dollars just parking cars. But it takes a lot of volunteers to do that. But we also need carpenters, plumbers, electricians, people that can do cement work, painting, uh, a whole variety of things that we're going to need help with over the years. And if you can volunteer and share with us your skill, um, then we can put together a body of talent in our community that we can draw on and minimize the costs that we have. Also, take advantage of the things that go on at park. You know, swimming classes, fitness classes, uh, show up for pickleball. I mean, it's all a good time. I think they're very, very well-run programs and very cost-effective. Also, attend events there. We've done 360 or so events in that theater over the last three and a half years. We got, I mentioned earlier, the Forever After Productions got Mamma Mia coming up next week. There'll be six shows. It'll sell out. Get your tickets early. They are great shows. $10 tickets in our media community. Uh, you have all kinds of parking at, uh, at park. That's not an issue. Uh, so uh, take advantage of what the place has to offer. In closing, you know, I just think we, I can't emphasize enough how much we really, really need the, the help and assistance from, from the community. We've cut it back to the bare minimum. I mean, Mark was telling you, showing you about $5 million. Well, we were looking at 10 or $12 million originally to do it, to really do it the way we wanted to, but, you know, now you've got to cut it back. But we still need around $7 million on that project. And, uh, you know, the last thing we want, believe me, is to have to sell that property. You know, if there's another way around that, if anybody's got ideas, I'm telling you, we're all ears. I mean, we didn't get into this. They have to sell it off. But, you know, we've got to do something to raise the money to save the school, or we're going to lose the whole thing. So, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have much choice in the matter. And we're going to need $200,000 a year to cover operating costs. Now, you know, we're going to be doing fundraising campaigns, and there's certainly people willing to participate. We've got, obviously, the Wilcox Foundation helping out with, with a nice chunk of that. And we've all benefited as citizens, uh, Plymouth residents and the city and the township and all the great work and the contributions people made prior to, to us coming along. I mean, Kellogg Park didn't just happen. Right? And there's a lot of great things that go on. We've got the museum. We've got the library. We've got... You know, a lot of great activities in this community in McClumpha Park and the township and the like. This is an opportunity for all of us today in this community to have a major impact on this community for decades and decades to come. And I would challenge this, this city and the township to really come to go to bat on this thing and let's all put it together. Let's leave this place a better, a better place uh, than we found it. So join us in the campaign. I'm going to turn it back over to Mark. I think he's got a couple of comments he'd like to make. And thanks for coming. We will have a Q&A in a little bit. Yeah, I actually have uh, two final items. The first is about appreciation. I want to say thank you to the fantastic tenant organizations. You are PARC. And thanks to the staff volunteers, foundations, the workers helping to fix up the building, the board members, to those who participate in or attend activities, the Citizens Committee who campaign for the millage and everyone who has supported Park in any way. You've all played an important role. No one is expecting this and my intent isn't to embarrass, but I'd like to give special thanks to two people. First is Don Suna. Don has worked tirelessly on this project for five years. No task has been too big or too small for Don to tackle. I don't know how he's done it, but I'm glad he has. Without Don, Park would not have grown as quickly and as well as it has. While working crazy long hours for free, Don and his wife Colleen have also been 
the biggest donors to cover the operating losses to date. The second person is my wife, Patty. I can't explain it, but she has an uncanny ability to visualize how things can become, and she isn't bashful about going all in to realize her vision. Patty saw the house called Pumpkin Hill literally falling apart and said, that may be the oldest home in, remaining in Plymouth, and we can save it. She feared the post office, maybe the most historic building left downtown, could become a bar or otherwise lose its historic character. That led to Westbourne Market and a statewide award for best historic building preservation. When Central Middle School was scheduled for closure and sale, she said, losing that building would forever diminish the character of Plymouth. And Park is the perfect reuse for the building and community. We've got to save it. My initial reaction to all three of these visions was that they wouldn't work, followed by maybe somebody else could do this. <laughs> I was wrong. She was right. Without Patty, the school building would long ago be demolished, and Park never would have happened. Please join me in giving special thanks to Don Soonan and Patty Malcolm. I'm going to get severely chastised when I get, get home, but uh, she earned it. <laughs> Last thing I want to do is read a letter. It's dated November 7th, which was the day after the millage vote. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Malcolm, my name is, I'm not going to say, and I'm a 15-year-old 15 15 year autistic singer, songwriter, pianist, and actress who takes lessons and so much more at the park. This morning, I read the township of Plymouth decided against the millage to keep the park growing into a performing arts center. I cried. Now it's at risk for closure. I'm writing to tell you how important the park is to me, and I'm hoping to somehow be part of allowing the park to live. I take voice and piano lessons with Kim Nagy at Eden Arts Cooperative in the park. I'm improving every day. In October, for the first time, I performed an original song at the In The Band Studios open mic night. It was amazing. I also met two friends who accepted me as I am, and we jammed in the front row to other performers. I've stayed in touch with these friends. That never happens. I've absolutely loved the Main Street Opera Company's group pizza parties and vocal coaching on the first Friday of each month. The Mitten Theater improv shows are hilarious and were a perfect part of my birthday present last week. There are so many items on my to-do list at the park. Being cast in a Forever After Productions play is still on my bucket list. Coming up, there's actor master, acting master classes in School of, Rock with Eden, uh, School of Rock with Eden Arts, Songwriters Circle at the In The Band studio, and about 20 classes that look incredible at Detroit Performing Arts Studio. There's so many doors just waiting for anyone to walk through and start a journey. When I think of the park, I don't think of an old building that needs a ton of work. I see a place that feels like home, a place where I'm accepted and I belong. It's magical. Thank you for everything. I'm grateful for all you've already invested in the park. Call on me if I can help. The park really is a one-of-a-kind arts center. I hope a plan can be made to save this special place. I don't know about you, I can't think of a more ins inspirational reminder that Park has nothing, nothing to do with the politics or any of the malicious nonsense that occurred in the run-up to the millage vote. It's about providing quality of life opportunities that are, are enriching the lives of people of all ages and backgrounds in numerous ways that are not otherwise provided in our community. Thanks for your attention. Let's do some Q&A. <clears throat> 